Welcome, everybody. Glad to see you for our last flyaway nights of this season. Um, we will be back in November uh, to start back up with new topics. And if you have topic ideas, send me an email. Um, love to hear them. So tonight, we are excited um, to in, hear from uh, Heather Nichols with the uh, RCD for Yolo County, Yolo County Resource Conservation District. And she's going to be sharing with us about a project um, that has been going on now for several years, uh, habitat corridors in the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area. And the little photo that I have here is one that we took. Uh, and it's quite the memory for me personally, uh, twofold. One is it is the last in-person activity we did uh, with the Waste and Foundation uh, before all shut down with the pandemic. Uh, so that is late March of 2020. And then uh, the kid in the background is one of my sons. So that was kind of fun too. So um, also, just because we are sitting here in April, I want to make sure everybody is aware that California Duck Days is coming April 29th, and uh, we're really excited about it. We're getting lots of plans together, lots of activities going on, wonderful exhibitors, uh, many activities throughout the demonstration area. Uh, grab a kid, come and visit. Uh, we got, well, I could go on forever, um, but that is not why you are here. So I'm going to stop my sharing and spotlight over to Heather so she can take it away. And also just to note, if you do have questions, I do ask that you put it in chat and we will um, pass those over your direction, Heather, uh, after you've done your presentation. So welcome, Heather. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Corky. I'm really happy to be here. My name is Heather Nichols. I'm the executive director for the Yolo County Resource Conservation District. I'm going to mostly be going through um, a slide deck, mostly of photos so that kind of take you behind the scenes on this project because most of it's um, not in the public area. So I'm going to um, go ahead and start my presentation and then you know tell you all about this project that actually just officially um, was was completed this last month in, of March. So hang on just a second while I share my screen. Okay, I want to make sure everyone can see that. But I can't see anyone's faces, so I'll need an audio. Yay or nay? Yes, it's looking good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So the uh, title of this talk tonight is the title of this project. Um, it's called the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area Corridors Project. And I guess I'll back up and just say um, the project was started in 2016 and just wrapped up and tried to address the issue that you see here, which is stranded wildlife during flood events. So most of you coming tonight probably already know this information, but the I'm just gonna go through it. The Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area um, owned by Fish and Wildlife, Department of Fish and Wildlife is a 16,770 acre wildlife refuge. The land is managed primarily as wetlands, rice farming and cattle grazing, and then primarily for migratory birds and flood protection. You see Sacramento in the background there. The wildlife area is also part of the, wild, the Yolo Bypass, which is a flood control channel, a flood control structure that protects Sacramento and other cities from flooding. And um, the wildlife area managed by the Department of Fish and Wildlife 
they're aiming to res- um, they're aiming to restore wildlife habitat in the Yolo Basin, uh, which is a natural basin in the North Sacramento San Joaquin River Delta. So you, you know, it's a haven for fish, shorebirds, wading birds, neotropical migrants, raptors, invertebrates, reptiles, amphibians, bats, of course, in this bridge here. Um, however, uh, as a flood control structure, uh, the wildlife area can also be a place where, where animals get stranded during flood events. And no, it's not a very clear photo, but you can see it's a coyote there. So this is a little video that shows. So this is, just to orient you, um, this is the Sacramento River out here. And this is the Fremont Weir, where in high flood events on the Sacramento River, water overtops the weir, also at the Sacramento Weir. And this video shows how the water moves. So we're, we're right over, um, well, if we were physically at the Yola Basin Foundation, we'd be right outside that area. If we were in the wildlife area, this is where the levee is, where you would drive over and get into the wildlife area. That's just south of um, I-80, so that kind of orients you. And then here's where the Delta and Cashloo starts to go, enter into um, Sacramento River and the Delta. So here we go. Here's a high resolution simulation of the Sacramento River's Yolo Bypass filling up during a big storm in 2006. Notice the floodwaters spreading through individual irrigation ditches and drains. That's the, the wildlife bluish area is now. darkening as water levels rise. Flood models need such fine detail when the acreage at stake is relatively small. Notice how the it goes resolution down makes and for then more accurate east and models, west. But it comes at a high cost in computation goes down time and then it heads and out. Early west. next year, the U.S. From Army east Corps of west. Engineers plans to release public software that greatly reduces the cost of running flood models at high resolution. Well, we don't need to hear that part. <laughs> but you get the idea there. Um, so, you know, as those floodwaters rise from east to west, that's where wildlife get stranded. Whoops, how did I get here? Sorry about that. Okay. And uh, wild, wild animals um, require four basic habitat components. That's food, water, cover, and space. And where's the cover? So we're, in, we're standing down, uh, we're down in the, in the middle of the wildlife area. This is in a, in a grazing area where there's some uh, cattle, cattle lease. And you can see it's, it, it, there's two things happening. Um, the wildlife area is managed for flood conveyance. So there is a vegetation management component to keep cover relatively out for floodwaters. But, you know, it's also a wildlife area. So when I, um, you can see that cover is missing. There's nowhere for animals to navigate towards to feel safe moving out west. Um, so, we're talking with um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife staff at the time, this was 2016. Um, I asked them, you know, the Delta Conservancy had some funding for habitat. Um, in the Delta proper, which the wildlife area is, and I asked, um, I asked them what they what they thought would be most useful, and this is what they told me um, was uh, some corridors, some cover for wildlife in a way that still works within the flood conveyance system. So here you can see it's currently a mixture of grazed and ungrazed grasslands which is primarily annual weeds and noxious invasive weeds, so not much cover. So um, I told uh, Jeff Stoddard, who was the wildlife manager at the time, we've got that covered, you know, we know how to do that. We, uh, the RCD has been putting in 
um, farm edge hedgerows for several decades in Yolo County. And um, I, I knew we could figure something out that would work um, for the wildlife area. So we proposed a project that would create floodway compatible wildlife and also pollinator corridor ha pollinator habitat and that make it corridor habitat um, to basically try to do try to build in as much um, ecosystem service as possible. So this is a picture of a hedgerow. Um, this is in a different part of Yolo County. These are the kinds of animals that would benefit um, from having uh, some cover, some places for um, uh, hab habitat for birds um, and for food for birds. So there's a, a couple of migratory songbirds there um, that would use this and some uh, pheasant, deer, monarchs. Um, and I just thought this was fun. This is a local uh, artist, Della Deer Almeida, um, who has depicted sort of uh, an artistic version of these corridors here in the Sacramento Valley area, where you've got all your farmland, um, but along the creeks, right, and the um, sloughs and the drainage areas and between farm fields, you can have these um, diverse uh, functional um, vegeta vegetation and corridors called the West Anew. So just, I think I said this already, but um, the project was funded by the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta Conservancy. Um, we did this in coordination with the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, to create the wildlife habitat on the wildlife area to help solve wildlife flood safety problems um, and enhance habitat year round. It was also pretty experimental. Um, there haven't been a lot of flood um, escape corridors like this. Um, we really couldn't find a lot of good examples. So it was also going in as a experiment um, to see what would happen. So the desired project outcomes were to increase the use of floodway escape corridors by, uh, by target species, uh, higher survival of target species during flood events, greater plant diversity that concurrently promotes enhanced food and cover for wildlife, and increased abundance or density of target wildlife throughout the year. So not just during, you know, if we're gonna do this, let's also think about um, the non-flood season and how those corridors can provide value. And then the output indicators of this project are to, were to develop five miles total of corridors and have them established by the end of the project. Um, the golden crown sparrow is one of the migratory songbirds that would use the woody structures of the hedgerow. So that's why that little guy's there. Um, we wanted to try to do uh, 22 acres of habitat and publicly accessible and, and publicly accessible demonstration planting and establish that. Um, primarily the acreage was to include a lot of native grassland to make that kind of acreage. And then um, we wanted to also keep track of the numbers of plants that were surviving in the corridors and the demonstration areas. And also uh, monitor the pollinator, butterfly, bird, and mammal wildlife data, as well as uh, target wildlife species um, that were using the habitat corridors and the abundance and species diversity of native bees, butterflies, and um, birds. That's a monarch butterfly there. So we were asked to try to monitor our uh, success. Um, 
I will say we haven't planted the plants yet, you know, um, uh, when this was going, you know, we had maybe just planted our first year, so they were baby plants. So that's sort of a, um, you'll see how, how this goes. I, it was, I started out, you know, having helped develop this project. Um, interested in getting baseline data and then trying to describe to um, the Delta Stewardship Council and other groups that a lot of our plants are not going to be fully mature by the time the grant is complete. So even with that, we, we went ahead and um, tracked plant survival counts. The bee and butter, we did bee and butterfly surveys with Point Blue Conservation Science. We did bird counts and area search and then and also capture photo, da photo, da photo data <laughs> from game cameras um, over several years. Um, we actually did more than two years, but that's two of our staff members um, setting up game cameras on an old trestle, which we'll hear about in a sec. Another bird that would benefit from this project, grasshopper sparrow. So the targets, um, when you write a grant, um, you know, using public dollars. You have to go through this process. It was really good for us to do. Um, we knew that usually our plant survival um, targets are higher than 75%, but knowing the area and the fact that it, um, you know, there could be catastrophic flooding or really deep long flooding, there could be, um, uh, it's really, uh, remote area in which to work. So we gave it a little lower plant survival just to be on the safe side. 75% um, plant survival. And then um, we suspect if all of our plantings continue to thrive and become fully established that we should see, we think, a twofold increase in the numbers of target wildlife species that use the habitat corridors. Um, we made a, um, a estimation that native bee numbers would double from baseline uh, to three, you know, during the three years after plants are planted. Um, and then the butterfly species richness and diversity would increase by at least three species. So this was based on um, working with Point Blue biologists and then assuming our timeline would stay on schedule. Um, so um, if you're with Yolo Basin Foundation and following them, this is one of their maps for uh, just to help orient you um, in how you usually think probably or use the wildlife area. So that's the auto route. And then, so this is the, just if you look down at the um, little pop out here, this is the area that's typically accessible. And here, as the crow flies several miles, is our um, what's called the North Corridor. And then down here at the very bottom of the boundaries of the wildlife area is the Southern Corridor. One more, just Sacramento, Todrain, I-80. And then we're we're working way down here most of the time in this little zone. And then there's an aerial of it, the demonstration area, the northern corridor, which is 2.7 miles, and the southern corridor, 2.2 miles. And then because we're working in a flood zone, I won't get into all of this, but um, it is uh, um, regulated, of course, by Army Corps, Department of Water Resources, the Central Valley Flood Protection Board, which works with both those agencies to ensure flood safety for West Sacramento, Davis, Sacramento, Natomas, Woodland. Um, we're very interested in this project, <laughs> and I learned how to about how about how the hedgerows we do all over the county, this one needs a hydraulic analysis. So we worked with CBEC Eco Engineering and um, did several different models around 
the increased vegetation and roughness, which are these little blips on the screen here to show, we, we needed to ensure the flood board that what we were going to plant would not change the uh, engineered um, capacity of the floodway. Uh, so understanding that and having many uh, conversations and discussions with the flood board, um, we were able to come to an agreement on plants that the flood board and Army Corps were and DWR were okay with, and that also would provide the habitat quality types that we were looking for. It does limit the, the planting pellet, um, but you'll see some of the things we did end up planting should provide a lot of value. So these are just showing the little roughness of those plants when at their full height and depth and breadth. Okay, so most people are familiar with this area. It's a demonstration area, park, parking lot A. This is um, right before the project got going in the ground. And I did put this photo in, that's, um, uh, you, you recognize friendly face there with Corky, and then we've got our staff and other volunteers from the Yolo Basin Foundation. We just finished doing our, our first planting. And one of the plants you'll see out there is called Coyote Brush, uh, Baccarus pilularis, and it's a shrubby plant. Uh, it blooms uh, early, like February, usually something like that. Of course, this February is probably partly underwater, but um, coyote brush can take a little bit of flooding. So that was obviously one of our constraints. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big bloomer, um, early bloomer. It attracts a lot of uh, beneficial insects and it provides great cover. So that's we've that's been a we've planted that in most of our areas except for the really wet spots that are near the toe drain. It's a little too wet for them there. And then this is another one that you'll see in the demonstration area. Um, we wanted to get as big of a, a range of plants that we thought would do well in the parking lot area um, that are down in the rest of the project site that um, folks aren't, you know, the public isn't usually able to get to. So you could get a sense of what plants might be down there. Um, and route wild rose we're able to use in a lot of the same spots that we can use coyote brush in. It can take a little inundation and some temporary flooding. But they're a great pollinator plant and also provide the rose hips provide food for birds. And then the thorny structure. Um, is great for protecting birds, uh, smaller birds from predators. And you know, at the RCD, we're, uh, we plan projects, um, usually in working land settings, which this is, and we do those. We have a field staff um, and we do like to find ways to work with volunteers. Um, but we're, you know, part of what we do is act, the actual getting uh, the plants in the ground. And these are tools uh, called dibbles. So we use dibbles. There's like a foot, um, like a foot spot that you can dig into the soil. It makes a small, narrow hole. Uh, that's a tray and in, in a set of empty trays, plug trays, um, where uh, native Vegetation of various kinds is grown, and you can put 200 plants, 250 plugs in there, carry it to a faraway place, and uh, a lot of things will grow well from plugs. So I'll show you a few things we planted from plugs, one of them being the narrow leaf milkweed. So um, narrow leaf milkweed is one of five uh, Yolo County local, locally native um, milkweeds that the monarch butterfly depends upon for habitat. 
Uh, we uh, tend to use the narrow leaf um, because it seems to be uh, the most preferred and um, it will take quite a lot of inundation. It's already in other areas on the wildlife area and it's, um, it's pretty easy to get going. So we planted, uh, planted some of those. And then not a great photo, sorry about that. But this is, um, you've probably seen this and even in front gardens and um, all kinds of places. It's deer grass, Muhlenbergia, right? Muhlenbergia rigens. It's almost like a shrub. If grass is, it's very shrubby. Um, so small mammals um, can use it as cover. Um, it won't take the super wet areas, but it will take like the parking lot and some other spots that we'll see in a minute. Um, it's good for in, um, in beneficial insects. Birds can use some of the ground birds like quail can use it as cover um, and amphibian snakes. Uh, so we do use this a lot. It's very easy to grow um, and has a lot of historical uses too. Another one we like to use in plugs is Grindelia. This is another plant. This is an amazing plant. It doesn't, it's one of those, I mean, it doesn't look like, it looks kind of like a weed, right? Um, but I can, this, this it, how you can tell it's a gum plant is literally like it's sticky when you touch it. Um, but this plant is unassuming, but is a serious powerhouse uh, when it comes to pollinators. Um, it is um, an amazing source of, it's long blooming A, um, and then it's also blooming in the late summer where very few other things are blooming. And then for some reason, and this is something that um, the entomologists in, at UC Berkeley and UC Davis, they've studied um, various wildflowers for pollinator benefits. And this is one of the top, one of the top plants that um, the most diversity, most preferred um, uh, bees and native bees in particular, ground nesting bees, um, solitary bees, and other kinds of beneficial insects, butterflies, honeybees. Um, uh, so, and this one just has, it can grow almost in any conditions we found. It can grow in dry, dry spots in the uplands and it can grow in these wet, bloody, heavy soils in the bypass. So another tool we use for habitat restoration, and we used it on this project, is a grass seeder. So you saw the deer grass, we have the other grasses, native grasses that we experimented with here. I'll just, this is what it looks like. All the true actual This makes little, it doesn't, um, till up the soil and you don't have to till the soil up with it, but it also um, has these uh, uh, flails in the, in the middle of the boxes that keep the seed from compacting down and getting clogged. Um, so you have uh, it's the, the uh, structure of a seed, native seed is just a little tricky. Sorry about that. Let's see if that so these are uh, four of the species that we thought would do well in the wildlife area. We know for a fact creeping wild rye, um, slender wheatgrass uh, do well here, and blue wild rye, meadow barley very well in these heavy um, soils. And you can see we plant those by seed. Um, how we keep our plants alive. Uh, this is still the demonstration area. It's the heat of the summer. And um, one of the uh, restoration practitioner musts or in restoration projects, almost all restoration projects in California, unless it's on a perennial stream, is going to need supplemental water uh, throughout the, at least the first two or three or four um, dry seasons. Um, that they after they've been planted. So we don't water them in the winter, but we water them through the dry season. 
And then after they get established, they don't need any more irrigation, but it's critical, absolutely critical to get water to these plants. So we really wanted to get this demonstration area planted, um, but there's not like a, um, you know, there's no plumbing out there. Uh, and there, we're not really near one of the, we're pretty near the drain, drainage dish, but not near enough. So for the demonstration area, we did need to fill up either on in a ditch or at the wildlife headquarters and uh, truck the water out, hook it up to our drip system. Um, and, you know, our staff would check plants, do weed management and other things while that while uh, the water, the irrigation took place. So looking back again towards Sacramento, this is in the foreground. These are chunky, nice, healthy. Some of them have gone to flower um, native grasses for the most part. There's probably still some annuals in there. And then to the left here, you can see deer grass and oh uh, shoot, I don't know if that's a buckwheat or probably not a buckwheat. I don't know. There's a few other things going on there around the bend and a quail bush. Um, and things are starting to uh, establish. That's what you want to see. So that's the demonstration area. That's way up here. And then we're going to, I'll take you down to the, uh, the Northern Corridor is what we called it in the grant. We actually, we just call it the trestles. And so our, we would go way out here down the El Macero and down to um, uh, the ranch um, entries in order to get up here. You can, if you're on a tour, we have taken um, volunteers down through the corridors this way. Uh, it's just usually there's a lot of gates and fences. But, you know, the other neat thing, ooh, oh, okay. Um, I'm going to show you this. So this is, okay, this is floodwaters, obviously. There's a, a tower, um, an electricity tower. And then this is what's called a trestle. It's a it's the Lisbon train, it's the old Lisbon train trestle. So there was a train that went through here, went actually all the way up to Chico at one point from Oakland to Chico. Um, the last time it ran was in like 1951. I have a, a really nice uh, summary from a volunteer, uh, Mark Hovnowski, who put together the um, an entire history on the Lisbon, um, the Lisbon Weir and this train here. If anybody wants that, I can send it your way. But this is during a flood event. It's it's March 11th, 2019. It's one of the trestles. And we have um, drone flight from TDFW. So you can, this is, this, this is going somewhere. So just bear with me, but check this out. Okay. It's going to fly over the trestle mound, and you will see a couple of deer up here. It's just grass. There's hardly any cover on there. Um, I mean, there is some grass and some, probably some uh, yellow star thistle and stuff. So there, there you go. There's a couple of deer there. They're completely stuck, and they'll maybe they'll be okay. This is the two of them, but they have no protection. Um, and not a lot of, of cover. I'm sorry, not a lot of forage there. And you, let's see if we, if it shows. That's, this is the trestles. Um, let me pause it. Let's see if it gives us another view. So there's the towers, the and then these are the different trestle mounds. So we ended up talking, when we were talking with DWR and the flood board and Army Corps, they were not keen on us putting a, a hedgerow corridor down low here. And they said, well, if you put them up on these mounds, um, it will be very unlikely to have any significant impact with um, roughness and uh, flood. Uh, getting in the way of floodwaters moving through here is what I'm trying to say. Um, so we hadn't done anything quite like this, but we said, okay, let's let's try it. So 
um, we assessed the trestles and thought we would give it a try. And we talked with biologists and I asked them if they thought vegetation on the trestles would actually provide some cover that would be useful. Um, and we got a worth trying sort of response. So we went for that. So here we're looking west in the trestles. And what's really cool about the trestles um, and this way going, you know, working way out here is that we were able to bring, these are high school students from the Center for Land-Based Learning SLEES program uh, out to these spots. And, you know, most people never see these areas and they got to check, they got to um, spend some time basically the whole day out there. So they're putting irrigation out, a um, couple of our staff, uh, couple staff from Center for Land-Based Learning. And, you know, uh, we, I think we have Yolo Basin volunteers too, or docents that talk about what people might be seeing, you know, what the students might be seeing out there. So our job is to get it planned, set it up, and then our partner organizations, Yolo Basin Foundation and Center for Land-Based Learning, in this case, um, and did the educational component and, and brought uh, volunteers out to the sites. And then uh, we do sort of the less uh, sexy part of the job, I guess, and that's weed management, tending these plants. Um, and it's a, it's a weekly or even um, weekly or biweekly work that we've been doing for the past few years. So uh, this is a good example of, these are a couple of our staff members. What they're doing is weed whacking around the plants to um, make sure you've got a few um, a coyote brush here. There's a rose here. I know there's several other species of things um, along here. And if we were to just plant them and just water them, the noxious species all around them would start to compete for water and compete for space and light. And so it's just part of um, uh, the restoration processes, uh, the is establishment and, and maintenance and management. So that's a rough cut mower. That's Brandon Baker on the weed whacker and Kenya Otto, Odo on, the, uh, on another weed whacker. So these are folks with long, uh, with degrees in uh, restoration ecology and long, time experience doing restoration locally. Um, water, again, irrigation, so important. Um, in this case, we were pumping water from the sloughs um, to, uh, to our pressurized drip systems. And then um, uh, if anybody knows what this is, um, what we, you can't see the critter <laughs> um, that built this, um, tidy little dam, but you can guess um, that it was a beaver, and this is a constant uh, source of drama uh, for uh, the folks who are growing rice out here, who are um, irrigating pasture, and then for us, uh, trying to keep our native plants alive. So that's that was interesting. Um, and then here's a trestle uh, that's getting going. Um, there's quail bush, there's a lot of coyote brush, and you and there's some rose here. Um, this is really starting to be different than what you saw in the drone image, where it's really just the um, that un the, the ground cover. Um, we have, you know, real cover that's coming in. So this was probably taken last year, 2021, after the plants were in the ground for the third season. This, that's my guess here. This is the third season. Um, this was how we um, talked with the flood board and also did our planning was in um, uh, the structure of the plant, the height of the plant, the width of the plant, and then percent cover. That's how we were able to communicate. So we weren't sure 
a hundred percent which plants would do the best in various areas. So um, we uh, kept kept it fair, fairly general, um, but also specific to percents of sizes of plants, which is what they really cared about. Uh, one of the plants that's out there, sorry again, it's blurry, it's mugwort. So there's a good photo of a leaf of a mugwort, flowers of the mugwort. Um, it's a great cover for small animals. There's really nutritious seeds that come off that plant and it's a good pollinator plant as well and very rugged and adaptable. And then we have uh, California blackberry also doing really well out there. Obviously it does have a fruit that a lot of um, birds especially like to eat. And then that same thing with the California rose, it's got a you know thorny structure. Um, and that's really excellent for small, um, small birds that protect song sparrows and um, specifically yellow-breasted chat uh, from one of the biologists' assessments. And I'm not sure if that bird is out there. I, um, we have a complete bird list of that if anybody wants to see um, the full on monitoring for it, you can do that. Okay, so we were at the Northern Corridor and this is by the way, the Lisbon Weir, if you've ever heard of that. And then further down is the South Corridor. So very different, we're leaving the trestles and we're going to um, this spot. Oh, this is um, uh, a series of uh, lifts that come from the tow drain. Um, and that water gets pumped up from the tow drain through the system. And we, uh, we were advised by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife that this would be another great spot to try to do a corridor, partly because there's already power line here. Um, and so there's not much that much else that can be done here. There's a maintenance road here, there's grazing ground here, um, and there's uh, water readily available. So it, it lined up pretty well. Um, we call it the Duck Club, Duck Club Canal because there's also a bunch of duck clubs over here that the department coordinates with. Um, for waterfowl conservation. So another great partner of ours is the Pewter Creek Council. These are a couple of our former staff members. There's a um, uh, uh, Pewter Creek Council steward. And this is a different, so this is a different kind of um, uh, volunteer event uh, with uh, folks from all ages, families, uh, and versus the Center for Land Based Learning, which is high school students. So we were able to, we were able to, to get a lot of folks out here, which was one of the goals of the project. And good old irrigation, it's bread and butter there. So you can see these are young deer grass. They haven't gotten super shrubby yet. And then um, and there's the Duck Club Canal, the road, the power line. And then there's mugwort and milkweed and coyote brush and other things growing there. In addition to so wettest areas, um, we also planted buttonbush, which is a really great swallowtail um, uh, insectary plant and uh, um, just generally pollinator. It's really pretty. It likes to grow near water, practically in it. So it was a good one for the, some of the super wet areas. Same with American dogwood. Um, it is uh, a wildlife powerhouse as well. Um, we, we only get to plant it in those wetter areas, but there's a, it's a host plant for the echo azure butterfly. Um, it serves, there's a little fruits that, that um, ripen and it feeds songbirds, game birds, waterfowl. Um, and then it provides good cover. It's actually, I didn't have a picture of this, but it's a shrubby plant. And these, by the way, these beautiful plant ID cards were made by uh, Puget Creek Council a couple of years ago. I think they still um, add to the collection and it's probably on their website, but it's, um, it's really great if you're interested in local 
native plants. Uh, that's their focus. And I just think they're so nice. Um, this is related to, this is mule fat and it's related to coyote brush. And it is something that we plant a lot of. It's also just a powerhouse. Um, it's good for birds, small mammals. Uh, there are little fruits here. It's also an amazing pollinator plant and easy to grow. You can cut um, even maybe this time because it's, uh, well, the, in the winter, you can cut um, branches of it and just stick it in the ground. It'll get going. So that's out there. And then um, let me check the time here. Okay, I'm almost, I'm almost, I'm doing pretty well here. Okay, the other element of the project was, you know, as it's experimental, um, we were asked to uh, monitor response. One of the ways we did that was with game cameras that you saw getting set up earlier. But this is our point blue biologist getting caught on, on the game camera itself. Um, and, uh, and I think it's pretty funny. So he uh, put together a full on technical report, um, which essentially, so here's a picture of what it was pri prior. Um, this trestle, that's one of the trestles. Um, it's it's a weedy grasses, some perennial pepperweed, which is a terrible noxious weed, but it's good for pollinators. Um, same with um, yellow star thistle. It's a noxious weed, but it's good for pollinators. Well, you have to cut all that stuff out and keep it down in maintenance mode in order to plant the natives. And then this is us almost walking away in some of our areas. Um, they got a little bit bigger than this, so you can see in the photos, but they're not at maturity. So um, essentially what it said is there's a dip in some of our goals, our target goals, but um, you know, what we really would like to do is come back in five years and 10 years and 15 years and do this all again. So we have um, that what I'm excited for about this wildlife um, use monitoring report for the Yolo Bypass Corridors project is that it sets up, essentially, uh, it has the baseline and then the very start of this restoration project. And uh, we are um, hoping to be able to continue, you know, check, keeping an eye and being able to continue to monitor that. So we'll see how that goes. But I wanted to share with you just photos from the game cameras. So we've got some sparring deer. We've got a great blue heron. And then, oh, I have notes to myself what those are, which I can look up in a minute. Um, pheasant, of course. And then there are some, uh, uh, some baby pheasant. I'm not the scientist in the room, obviously, but, um, uh, and then there's an owl here. And then uh, this is really funny. This is the eye of an owl um, that got really close at night. Uh, coyote, a couple coyotes. Uh, so there's more pictures in the report if you're interested in that. Um, but looking out, um, I wanted to say here is uh, this is a group of high school students at a SLU's day with the Center for Land-Based Learning. Um, and there's a Delta Conservancy staff member here. He now works for Department of Fish and Wildlife, but he's great. He has a local, he has like a wildlife blog. Um, he's a birder. So he's teaching the kids how to do birding and what birds are out there that are really neat. Um, but uh, again, looking out um, after this year of really good rain, um, we're feeling really confident about the, uh, the corridors project. We would like to keep taking folks out there to, and we would like to find funding or engage with the university or, you know, we'll figure out some way to, in the future, you know, be able to uh, continue to see what the response is on this, on this project. So this is another game camera photo. 
during a flood event. This is a different trestle. There is a, a little bit more cover out here. Um, but you've got a deer in the sunset. So I just wanted to, you know, I'm happy to answer all, whatever questions you have. I just kind of gave a really light restoration oriented um, introduction to this, but um, did want to thank um, the Ola Basin Foundation for letting me talk tonight and Delta Conservancy for funding the project, um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for uh, being the, they're, they're taking on the long-term responsibility of of um, uh, you know, hosting these corridors, obviously as a landowner. Um, the, uh, Yolo the Yolo Basin, uh, Yolo Basin Wildlife Area staff, like the Department of Fish and Wildlife staff have been really awesome. The Yolo Basin staff have been really awesome. Um, and then I wanted to also give a shout out to Shane Enterprises. They're the rancher out here or cattle grazer. And I, for trusting us around their cattle um, and also pulling us out of uh, mud spots and jump starting our cars and all kinds of things. And we, so we became close with, close with them. They're really good, really good folks uh, that lease, uh, they lease the property from the department way down in that area and they do wildlife friendly grazing. Um, all our project partners, which I highlighted all of them throughout this talk, and then the many, many, many volunteers um, that came out to these wild spaces and spent the day irrigating and planting and so on. Um, so, yeah, I'm interested to, to see, um, you know, what questions people may have, um, uh, information you're interested in knowing. Um, and there are other opportunities like this if you're interested in doing wildland planting, um, not just with us, but with other uh, local organizations. Thank you. That's, you know, it, it's amazing to watch the restoration going on out there. Um, you do have a couple of questions coming in. One is first, can you explain what a, a resource conservation district is? Oh, sure. Yeah, of course. Sorry, I, I didn't do that. Um, okay, so resource conservation district, it's a local government agency, essentially. It's like a fire district or a water district, except that we are, our mission is to um, address conservation issues at a local level. So um, uh, we have a voluntary um, board um, who are Yolo County um, farmers, ranchers, um, prof professionals who care about um, the interface of conservation here in, in Yolo. Um, and we, um, you know, our job is essentially to understand, you know, what are their local issues, what, um, what, we, what can we do to address them, uh, and, uh, you know, what, what, what else, we end up doing a lot of partnering because there's a lot of, a lot of efforts in Yolo County to um, address conservation. Uh, so we have found over the years that we, we are, we tend to have, there's a need for working lands and public land um, uh, planning and implementation uh, of a lot of small projects. We tend to do a lot of that, um, but you know, after, for example, after the LNU fire and the county fire, um, we decided to get involved in wildfire prevention and now we're learning to do prescribed fire and vegetation management for conservation oriented fuels reduction. So, um, and then there's the whole carbon sequestration on land that we're starting to do carbon farm planning. So we are able to adapt to local needs and, um, and interests with, with folks. Check out our Does website. every county have one? 
So yeah, almost every county has one in California. Um, in some states in the US, they're called soil and water conservation ser services. So most states have the equivalent of an RCV. Um, and, and, you know, the RCD of Tahoe does mostly forestry work and the RCD and in Inland Empire does has a community you know, the, the one in San Diego has a organic community bilingual uh, uh, urban farm program, you know, so it really it's very it's supposed to be locally relevant and um, effective, you know, from that perspective. We do a little bit of regional work, but it's mostly local. Super. So you do have some questions that have come in. Um, the first one was, uh, will the Southern Corridor stay above water during the floods like the trussles? No, that's a good question. Um, so the Southern Corridor is, there's a, there's a levee around uh, the Puda Creek where Puda Creek comes into the wildlife area. That's the that's about as far as the levee goes. And as you get farther away from that levee, the water that comes in during flood events spreads out to a you know, larger, wider area. It goes underwater though, down in the south, Southern Corridor. And so that's one of the reasons why um, we, we plant coyote brush and deer grass on the west side where it really doesn't go under much water. And then on the east side near the toe drain where you get most of the, you know, if you imagine that map going through, it's really close to the toe drains where it's mostly it's the deepest, it's the lowest parts where we put in the dogwood and the um, button willow, the button brush, um, ones that we know can hang out uh, underwater for a little bit. Um, can you talk about the consideration of the uh, connectivity of the corridors so the animals aren't getting stranded and can move away from flooding or other hazards across the bypass. I imagine that might have been in conflict with impeding the flood water. No. Um, so what we're trying to do is provide enough cover for a long enough um, a long enough um, trajectory out to the west and to high ground where where the flooding has it, the, where the flooding stops. So the idea is to move is to provide enough cover um, through it. That's why they're several miles long. Um, there's a lot of cover near the toe drain. And then you know we try to provide it enough you, you're talking with biologists to get them to dry land on the west side. So it is all about adequate connectivity, and that's the goal. And we're not sure how it will work on the trestles as the trestles become very mature. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. You still have game cameras out there, do you think? I'm pretty sure we do. We, we also, um, one of our roles, for a while now has been to liaise between the state and the lessees on the ag leases out there. So we are still, we're still active in the wildlife area um, and interested in, in doing that. It would be, uh, we could use a volunteer to monitor, you know, to read the game camera data. If anybody out yeah. there um, thinks that might be Fun, a fun job because that's pretty time consuming. And now that we don't have grant funding, the going through the data, we'll, we'll kind of have to volunteer, either find some a researcher that may be interested in doing it, you know, continuing the project, find more funding to do the monitoring or, or uh, rely on citizen science, scientists to do it. Um, we had another question. Um, uh, Yes, uh, I'm curious about the role beavers play. You mentioned they are a factor for both ag <laughs> and restoration. Thanks for your virtual work in this webinar. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, they just, you know, they like to dam up water um, for their own habitat. And so any either, anytime there's a culvert, uh, it's an opportunity for them to, uh, it's easier for them to 
you know, put a bunch of vegetation in front of it and start damming the water back. So then it just, what it does uh, for folks that need the water downstream from that is it stops the water flowing. So it, it can really uh, cause some either delays in water or need for dealing with the, the mat, the um, clearing the culvert back out. Uh, there's uh, in a, and uh, the county has been for uh, a number of years leading uh, a drainage improvement, uh, drainage improvements in the whole of the Yolo Bypass um, to have more free span crossings that beavers aren't going to care about um, that will keep the water fun water movement function for um, you know, wetlands management, you know, rice farming and, and rangeland management. Because the I'm not an expert in any of this, but I've, the uh, keeping the land in working lands, it's good for the economy. And it's also, um, uh, it keeps vegetation. It, we're able to have wildlife and farming uh, in the same spot. But one of the things we need for that is what, being able to convey water through the area. So it's important. It, it probably trumps, in my opinion, the beaver habitat to be able to be able to manage water in the bypass because there's rice farmers that have been um, doing bird friendly, you know, waterfowl friendly farming for decades now, pretty much. And now they're working on fish friendly rice farming. That's a whole other topic that would be interesting for this venue, but where you can um, help with fish habitat and uh, holding back water on rice fields that are fallow and the decomposition of uh, the water and with the rice stubble creates a lot of fish food and then you release that into um, the delta tends delta and the levee parts of the Sacramento River tend to be nutrient starved. So because of the levee systems and stuff, so being able to feed the uh, delta and river systems for salmonids um, is something. Fish, um, sorry, the rice far rice farmers in this area are totally on board with because it doesn't impede on their operations and they're happy to do it. Um, so it's an interesting place, you know, where wildlife and, and uh, agriculture uh, work together. At beavers <laughs> are um, also just really active and sometimes they can work in your favor. A lot of times they have their own agenda. They do. We uh, we struggle with them, but yet we appreciate them. Yeah, and you know, in more wild areas where you're not looking at farming, they can be incredibly important for helping wetlands. Uh, so it does become a balance, at least here. I think we hit all the questions. Um, I want to thank you for for joining us this evening, uh, all the participants for joining us, but but especially, of course, for you, Heather. Um, for taking time to share what you guys are doing out there. Um, and so nice to see that there's a place for some of those critters when the season changes and the water comes up like it did this year. Very good. Happy to be here. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. And one final plug, of course, we for duck days. Don't want you all to forget. So maybe we'll see you out here and RCD is going to be one of our exhibitors, so uh, stop by, stop by their table, say hi, tell them, uh, tell them something you learned tonight. Thanks so much.